Welcome to the Writing One presentation, Evaluating Sources. To follow along with this presentation, you'll want to have your How to Write Anything book open to Chapter 40, and you'll want to also look at a pocket style manual. Much of our content comes from pages 94 through 101. Whenever you find a source, you should ask yourself two questions. First, how could I use a source in my paper? And second, is a source right for my paper? When you ask, how could I use a source, you want to, of course, keep in mind what your assignment is supposed to be all about and what you're supposed to be doing with it. So you're looking through the source and you're going to need to improve your skimming skills. That means you're looking through something very quickly. You're not reading through every single piece of information that you find. When you find resources, you're not giving every single word of those the once over. You're basically just skimming through looking for key ideas, looking for topic sentences, and we mean by topic sentences, we'll talk about those more in another presentation, but by topic sentences we mean the sentence in the paragraph that basically tells your readers what the paragraph's main point is going to be or where that paragraph is moving. And then looking at the beginning and ending of sources because usually those will introduce and then conclude what those ideas are. You're also going to look at introductions and abstracts if you have those for some articles. Um, some articles do have a little bit of an introduction before the article itself. Others will have an abstract, which is kind of like a summary. It'll also talk about some of the research methods. You can look at those and tell pretty quickly if you can use it or not. You also want to ask, is this source right for my paper? Again, thinking back to the whole idea of the rhetoric in your writing, think about your purpose, think about your audience, and is this source a good match? So what's your purpose? What's your audience? And what are the sources? And do they match up? Do they work together? So if you have a source that is primarily for scholars and researchers who are well versed in the course, then yeah, you can probably use it for your audience because your audience may not be all that scholarly if you're writing for your classmates or even for your instructor here. I may not be an expert in that field. But at the same time, you're bringing information from those and explaining it to people who need to know more. Whereas if you're writing for people who know a lot about a field, you don't want to use a general generic resource that's going to tell them things they already know. You also want to work to make sure that you have lots of credibility in a source. So credibility, credibility, credibility. Is a source credible? And we're going to continue talking about that throughout this presentation. Before you continue, take a moment if you need to hit pause on this recording, that's okay. And think about why is credibility so important? In other words, why is it so important that when you look at a source and you think about using it, why is it so important that that source be credible? As we move on, we can see a number of questions that will help guide us to find out how credible a source is. First question is, does the website or document have an author? Sometimes you have to click and scroll around to find that information. Sometimes you can find that under the About This site or About Us. You can find that usually at the bottom or top of articles as well. Once you find the author's name, can you tell whether he or she is credible and knowledgeable? That's really important, and hopefully you thought about this earlier, but that's important because you don't want to just give your readers random information from somebody who doesn't know what he or she is talking about. So you want to find what the author's qualifications are. Again, many articles, many good sources will actually tell you those qualifications right away. You don't have to spend a lot of time digging for them. Sometimes you have to look around. Uh, sometimes you have to do an extra search or two just to find out who the author is. You also need to find out who sponsors the website. This can be important because often you're going to find out what some of the bias is or maybe why a group thinks it's important to actually put some information uh, out there. Sometimes they have really good reasons that they want to put out there that have to do with just helping people know the information. Often organizations and website sponsors have a hidden agenda or maybe not so hidden of an agenda that they have a specific side they want to promote and they have a vested interest in having the information come out a certain way. So you want to find that out. Uh, so you look to see who sponsors a site Usually down toward the bottom of the page you can find that information. You also want to think about the URL. That's the part up in the top uh, address part of your browser. And the domain name can tell you things like if it's a commercial site, which means it's primarily a business, um, that's .com, an educational website, .edu. 
Again, their primary reason for putting things out is not to sell them like a .com site might be. It's just to put the information out there to educate people. Nonprofit organization is going to be .org. Governmental is going to be .gov. Military is .mil. Or a network, and you're seeing this more for commercial websites too, is .net. Sometimes the URL is going to give a country of origin like .uk for the United Kingdom. Or Japan's would be .jp. One you'll see sometimes is .ca for Canada. As you're evaluating a source on a website then, you have to look at some other things like what is the purpose in the audience? Again, why was the site created? To argue a position, to sell a product, to inform readers? Who's the site's intended audience? And sometimes you're not going to know that, you know, just from looking at it immediately, but think to yourself, who are they writing for? Are they writing for other experts? That might be a good sign. Are they writing for just the general public? Sometimes that's not a great sign because the general public often can be easily manipulated about something. You also want to look and see how recent the site is, um, if the articles on it are fairly new. Sometimes that makes a difference, sometimes it doesn't. But you don't want to do research that has all old information um, when maybe they've discovered new things. You also want to take a look at the website and see does it link to other things and if a lot of those links are broken maybe you think wow this site is out of date and maybe it really isn't going to be all that helpful. If you do a lot of your research just browsing around on the internet as many students do you do have to always constantly be on guard and I have a picture up here that's from a basketball game and we have a player here who is on guard and she's probably trying to make sure that the person passing the ball doesn't get it to the person she's trying to guard or that if the person who she's guarding does get the ball that she doesn't just run away with it. All kinds of different reasons that we have somebody on guard. With your work though, with evaluating a website and evaluating all kinds of other sources that you run across, you have to be on guard. We can be easily manipulated. If we're not experts on a subject, oftentimes we'll read things and they sound good, they look good, but they're not true or they're completely unbalanced so you really need to stay on your guard. Here are some ways that you can check for signs of bias. Now let me start this off by saying that bias isn't always a terrible thing and sometimes we know that we're bringing in a source and it does have some bias and so we're going to explain that to our readers. Maybe we're showing various sides of an issue. Maybe we want to almost pull apart some arguments from another place. So we can use some biased sources now and then, but we want to at least be aware what we're working with. So here are some questions that you can ask to see if there are signs of bias. Number one, does the author or publisher endorse political or religious views that could affect objectivity? And sometimes that's hard to tell, but you want to look for those things. So look around at the different articles by an author if you can find more articles or if you can look around on the website at sponsorship again. It could be that your source has a political battle or has very strong political views that because they go for a certain party or because they have a certain way of looking at things that will heavily affect the way that they approach it. Hard to avoid in many cases but you at least want to know what you're working with here. So if you've uh, got somebody who's a major member of a political party or if they have lots of other articles and they're definitely pushing a certain view you just want to know that and tell your readers about that and, and let your readers in on that see if they're affiliated with a special interest group like Greenpeace or the National Rifle Association that might present only one side of an issue those can both be very credible organizations they both do some good research but the research is going to be very one-sided so if you're doing a paper about gun control and your paper is going to be much narrower than just gun control because that's all kinds of stuff but if you're doing a paper about gun control and most of your research comes from the NRA you're not doing a good job with research now you can bring in some of those things and they might have some things that you think are important to say about the topic but just bringing that in as good research without explaining where it came from or without balancing it out, that's really a terrible move. And that doesn't matter which side you're coming from. You also want to make sure that you are uh, looking at alternative views, both in your own research and looking at the sources that you're using. If, again, they're all just one-sided, then they're probably not being fair and they probably are overlooking some important things. And you want to look at the author's language and see if that shows signs of bias. If they're very emotional, if they're trying to get people excited about things and the language that they use, 
then probably they're not very trustworthy. As you evaluate sources, you also want to assess their argument. Down the road in this course, we're going to be spending a lot more time talking about argument, and you'll enjoy that because you'll learn how to construct a good argument and help persuade people to see your way of looking at a specific issue, and you'll also learn how to de deconstruct other people's arguments. So this is just sort of a, a brief way of thinking about this for now until we learn more. But you want to look and see what the author's central claim or thesis is. And this will help you not only decide if you want to use it or not, this will help you as you're taking notes too. You also want to look at how the author supports this claim. Does the author actually use relevant and sufficient evidence that is well researched? And you're learning how to do that research now, so you'll get more practice on seeing if it's good research. Or if the author just tells a bunch of stories and emotional examples, Usually that means it's not very trustworthy for a college level research paper. You also want to look and see if the statistics are consistent with those you can encounter in other sources. Oftentimes people with, will misuse statistics and you want to look at that. You want to see if they're using them selectively. So just pulling out a certain statistic without looking at the entire study or omitting details. Um, does the author explain where the stats came from? Because sometimes authors will give you statistics, but they'll not cite their sources. They'll not say where they came from. You want to see if the author is making any assumptions that maybe the author shouldn't make. Um, you also want to see if the author is bringing in opposing arguments and, and talking about the other sides of the issue. And down the road, you'll talk about logical fallacies as well. Again, we'll be studying these things later in the semester. And as you learn these things, you'll be able to integrate them into your evaluation of sources. As you're looking around at different sources, especially those that might be on the web, it's easy to get fooled. And, and so you need to take a guard to make sure that you don't get fooled. It's going to happen to us all now and then. We don't want it to happen while we're doing our papers. And, and if you're a user of social media and Facebook, you and probably other people that you know are constantly posting things that if you actually research and look into them, you'd realize you're getting fooled. That happens to all of us. But it shouldn't be happening in our academic papers. In our college level papers, it's important that we don't get fooled and pass along faulty information. A couple of things that help look um, and, and see if it sounds like it's an academic source and if it's a good, uh, decent website. Those are things that we can look at and our books will tell us to look for those things. But sometimes groups that are not credible still have good-looking websites and interesting sounding names. So sometimes uh, we'll see that um, a place still is not very credible. We want to be very careful about this. Uh, I've had examples where students actually get information from hate groups like the KKK or even the Family Research Council um, where these groups often exist to spread hate and misinformation um, or you know they may not seem like they're bad people but they have one or two areas where they really just can't be trusted and so you want to not just look at the name of a place because as you can see on this graphic here um, you as a user might see a good looking website you might see that um, it says something about citizens against blah 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 or it's some kind of a think tank and the people all sound smarter than you. And again, they may look great, but there's a hate group. So it's important to kind of follow the trail and find out who really sponsors an organization. That's also why it's important that you have different sides of things in your research, because if it's all one-sided, then oftentimes you're bringing in some bad research. Your best bet is to, as much as you can, find scholarly sources. And again, those won't always be without bias, but usually at least the research is solid and you know that you can at least trust the research even if you disagree with their conclusions. And that's what scholarship is all about, is disagreeing but still having good research. So here are some ways that you can determine if a source is scholarly. Um, again, we have looked in our class before at peer-reviewed and what that means, the editorial process for that. We also use the term refereed when we talked about that. So here are some things that you can look for. First of all is formal language and presentation. Again, people who are not trustworthy can use that formal language, but at least that's one thing that you can look at. Um, if it's really in slang terms or if the way that they present it is not very professional, you can at least look at that and, and rule them out pretty quickly. 
You can look for authors with academic or scientific credentials. At least that's one more thing that you can check for. Have they received some good education and some training and so you know that maybe they know what they're talking about. You also want to look at the source itself and see if it has footnotes or bibliography documenting the work cited by the author and the source. Um, that way you, you know that they got their information from somewhere they didn't just make it all up. And a scholarly source is generally going to have that in there. More ways to determine if a source is scholarly. Do they have an original research and interpretation rather than just a bunch of summaries of other people's work? Um, if they have quotations from and analysis of primary sources, um, especially in, in the humanities disciplines like literature, history, and philosophy. And with both of these, these first two that we look at, basically we're looking at um, some sources out there, especially on the internet, are just compiling information from other places. They may not even tell you where, but they're just compiling a bunch of information and regurgitating it because they want people to visit their websites. Um, with good scholarly work, they're doing their own research and they're making some interpretations. Again, you can agree or disagree, but you know at least it's fairly credible. And then they're working with primary sources in addition to secondary sources. They're also going to often describe their research methods um, or do a review of related research. And especially in the sciences and social sciences, they'll talk about other research in their field quite a bit um, and how they got to the research that they did. Um, if you look on pages 350 to 351 in your writer's reference book, you'll actually see a sample scholarly source um, that's been worked through and has some good examples there um, of the things that you want to look for. Um, and then 351, they contrast that with common features of a popular source, um, and that would not be a scholarly source. And again, they go through and give notes and tell you what you're looking for. That's incredibly helpful to look at, and, and I highly recommend you pause this presentation, take a look at pages 350, 351, and then come back. Um, I will note that in some databases that we look at, especially EBSCOhost and Gales Engage, you can actually run your search so that all that comes up are your peer-reviewed scholarly journals, and that can be a good thing. This next slide is a little bit of a fun take on this. If you're just listening, you may want to look at this slide here. Um, again, popular meme that's out there. But this is something that I think sometimes when I look through and students have done a research paper and these students seem like they're fairly intelligent people, but all of their sources are from untrustworthy places. And we've gone through, we've spent time teaching how to find good sources, but some students still don't even do that. They just hit Google and see what the first thing to pop up is. And as a result, their research is not credible. That's unfortunate. Now that you've been through this presentation on evaluating sources, now would be a great time to go work through the practice exercise and evaluate some sources and see what you learn from getting some practice.